Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here at Stonebrook. I'm really glad that you took time to hang out with us today. And uh, what we're going to do starting today and over the next few weeks is we're going to nerd out just a little bit. Um, the last few messages we did, I said we were nerding out then, so looks like we're getting in a pattern of nerdness here. But uh, this will be mainly directed probably toward Christians, those that you know already consider Jesus as a person that you're following. But uh, also, at the same time, if you're a person who was raised in church or you've been uh, around Christians and you've heard some different things that they talk about and you think, wow, that's really weird, this will hopefully help you too. And the the subject, we'll just throw out there, here's what our subject is going to be. Uh, the title, in fact, of this series will be, and it's called The End of the World as You Know It. Or The End of the World as We Know It. And as R.A.M. said, and I feel fine. Um, if you grew up in church at all, you've heard people talk about, quote unquote, end times. That there is going to be, uh, they call them sometimes the last days. There's going to be this time when the culmination of the ages is that somehow God had this plan that time would eventually end. Jesus would return on a cloud with a trumpet. Uh, you maybe have heard the term the rapture. And uh, that people are going to be taken away. Some people are going to be left behind. Um, growing up as a child in the 70s and growing up in church, there was this really cool guy. He was uh, sort of the grandfather of Christian rock, in fact. And, of course, all of us, all we, were, all we ever heard of was hymns. And there was this guy named Larry Norman. He had long hair, had electric guitars. He was really cool. But he had this song called, I Wish We'd All Been Ready. And um, it starts, you know, life was filled with guns at war and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold, a piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. It's su supposedly talking about this time in the future when things are going to get really, really, really bad. Um, the Antichrist, and maybe you've heard that term, uh, this person that is uh, from Satan himself, that he is going to be in charge all over the entire world. Things are going to get really, really tough. Uh, anyway, the song goes on and says, there's no time to change your mind. The sun, Jesus, the sun has come and you've been left behind. And usually we put a little delay on that in the PA system. You've been, and the song always ended like this. You've been left, left. Left, left. And all of us were so afraid that we had done something terrible and that we didn't know Jesus well enough and we were going to be left behind when all the good people were taken away to heaven to be with him and we were going to be here with the Antichrist and not having enough to eat and having all kinds of sores and boils and scorpions and all kinds of awful things were happening. So we got up for the 47th time, went to the altar. They always played this song at youth camp. You're going to be left behind. Then in the 90s, uh, there were a couple people who wrote a series of, uh, I think someone just died there on the set, <laughs> but uh, a, a guy wrote this series of books called Left Behind, the Left Behind series. In fact, there was eventually a mm, sort of poorly made movie starring Nicolas Cage, sorry Joe, um, uh, called Left Behind, and these books sold millions and millions and millions of copies, and it basically is based on this fearful concept that someday Jesus is going to return and there's going to be a rapture of the church, people that are Jesus followers, and boy, you better be on board. There was an old gospel song when I was being <laughs> raised once again in the 70s, I'm going to take a trip on that good old gospel ship and you better be ready, you better have your ticket because Jesus is coming and you may not make it and you do not want to be left here on the earth while the good people go to heaven and have a party and things like that. So we're going to explore that question of uh, the end of the world as we know it. Is it a scriptural concept? Is it something that Jesus said? Is it something that the early years, earliest disciples, the early church believed? And why is it taking so long? It's been 2,000 years since Jesus was here on the earth. Uh, what did he say about the quote-unquote in time's last days? And is it something that's going to happen soon? Is it going to happen ever? And uh, what does that look like? So 
I want to, first of all, uh, I'm just going to try to take my time and sort of wander through these various scriptures, and I hope you enjoy nerding out with me here. But um, let's talk about this concept of rapture. Now, the concept, uh, the, the scripture that people use to talk about this rapture, which means, if you, if you have an earthly idea of what, what are you talking about, rapture? It's a concept that Jesus is going to return before a bunch of bad things happen. And that's why, by the way, when any time that there is some sort of civil unrest or political upheaval or just natural disaster or something like that, Christians will say, Jesus must be returning soon because things are getting so bad. We'll explore that in the future as well. Uh, does it mean that it's the end time just because things are getting bad? Does the Bible say somewhere when things get really bad, Jesus is about to return? And... Are things any worse now than they were when Jesus was on the earth? Are things getting worse? Or are we just more aware? Or have things been a lot worse in the past and Jesus didn't come then? So why would he come now? Because things are bad. But anyway, the rapture is the, con the concept that Jesus will return. Take the Christians up to heaven. And so many people believe in that while those Christians are in heaven for seven years on the earth, there will be turmoil, turmoil and chaos. Uh, mark of the beast, we may talk about that. You know, what in the world is that? Is that something, is it a microchip? Is it a vaccination? Maybe I'm not supposed to get the COVID vaccination because it's the mark of the beast and I don't want to be left behind and go to hell because I did something wrong. All these things are concepts that Christians for years and years have talked about. We want to find out, is there any basis for that in scripture and especially in the things that Jesus said? Um, I, I want to just start with a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a, uh, a church that um, he started in a town called Thessalonica, and they had some questions for him. This is actually one of the very first letters that the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul was a guy who started lots and lots of churches among Gentile areas of the Roman Empire. He was a follower of Jesus, and um, they had some questions for him because he had, he had been to their area, he'd started this gathering of believers, and he told them that Jesus was um, going to return someday, and they were wondering, they were excited, oh, Jesus is going to return, we're going to be with him forever, he's going to set up an eternal kingdom, that is going to be great. And so they, um, they thought that was amazing, but then time passed, and it had been... 10, 15 years. And all of a sudden they began to notice that some of their loved ones, Uncle Charlie passed away last year and Aunt Sue is about to die. So does that mean that they don't get in on this eternal kingdom of Jesus? They died. What if Jesus returns and Uncle Charlie's not here anymore? He missed everything because he died before Jesus could get back. So hey, Paul, what's up with that? So Paul responds to them, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's read it. He says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died. This was their question. Hey, Uncle Charlie died. Will he be in? So you will not grieve like people who have no hope. This is really encouraging, by the way. If you've had uh, a wife, a daughter, a child that um, is no longer with us, Paul is saying, it's fine, fine to grieve. Don't ever listen to Christians that say, oh, you don't need to cry about them or you don't need... No, he, he doesn't say not to grieve. Just don't grieve like people who don't have something to look forward to, hope. And he goes on and he says this, for since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, and that's the basis for all that we're going to talk about, about the end of the world as we know it, about the future, about eternity is that Jesus came and he defeated death. He died, just like we die. He identified with us. But he's basically saying death isn't the ultimate. Death is not really a big deal. He rose again from the dead, not just to show off, but to break death's power and to make a way for us to follow him in that resurrection. This is kind of important to know as well. Um, to the Jewish mind, 
the, all through the Old Testament, and Paul, of course, is Jewish. He's writing to some people who are Jewish, a mixed audience in this church of Jewish people and Gentiles. But to the Jewish mind, there was never, ever a concept of some faraway place where we would spend eternity and floating on a cloud around a throne worshiping. I know when I was, uh, once again, when I was a kid in the 70s, today is a therapy session of me talking about my childhood. But when I was a kid, they would talk about heaven. And heaven to me pictured some sort of bright, shiny place. A lot of times people picture floating on a cloud, strumming a harp, um, wearing a white robe, maybe even turning into an angel, which is certainly not what the Bible teaches. But they said that we're going to spend eternity worshiping around the throne. And all I could think of as a younger person and then as a teenager is, that sounds terrible. <laughs> Why would I want to spend every minute of every day, not only for the rest of my life on earth, but millions and millions of years around a throne singing the songs that my church sings? Is that what we're going to be singing? We sang hymns, and I don't want to do that forever. But to me, the only alternative taught by my church was, well, you can burn in hell. Make your choice. Make it quick, because Jesus is coming, and you may be left behind. But that is not what was in the mind of Jewish people. They believed, in fact, that Jesus was going to come to earth and set up an eternal kingdom. This is what confused his earliest disciples so much, is that this Messiah, Jesus kept talking about the kingdom is here now, but then when he died, they were like, what in the world happened? It's over because they expected that when Jesus came to earth that it was forever. The first time he was here and they began to realize, we think this is our Messiah, they expected him to vanquish the Roman army, which has occupied the nation of Israel, set up an eternal kingdom. All his disciples pictured themselves as the cabinet in his new administration. The you know, Apostle John thinks, uh, well, I'm going to be the Secretary of State, maybe Peter will be the Secretary of Defense, and we'll make Judas the Secretary of Transportation. I don't know. But they will certainly not make him over the treasury. But they believed that there was going to be an eternal kingdom on the earth now. So when the Jewish mind talks about eternity, talks about an eternal reign of Christ, they don't picture us going somewhere else. They picture right here, right now, on the earth, Jesus coming to make things new again, to, make the, to restore things to God's original purpose in his original creation. So, but they said Jesus returned to life. We also believe that when Jesus returns, now this is an established thing that Jesus himself says, and Paul says that Jesus is going to return somehow to the earth. God will bring back with him the believers who have died. In other words, those that have died, they're not just gone. They're not just turned to dust and that's the end. They are somewhere right now. We are not just a body. We are spirit, soul, and body. And so the part that's not the body is somewhere with him. And when he returns, he'll bring them with him. He goes on and says this. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living <clears throat> when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. Meet him. Meet him. That's really important. And he goes on to say, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. We may talk, maybe next time we have a little more time to delve into this, but a, a trumpet, especially through the Old Testament, it's always announcing the glory of God, the arrival of God. When when In the Old Testament, and this would be a picture that Paul is using to explain to his Jewish audience, when um, God came down on Mount Sinai to deliver the law to Moses, there was the sound of a trumpet. It's announcing the arrival of the king. In fact, even in the Gentile and the Roman uh, people would have understood, when there's a trumpet, it means the king is showing up. It might even be a trumpet with a, with a commanding general that's returning from war. So this is the picture that Paul is painting. The trumpet of God, call of God, first, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. So Paul is making this wild claim that those, Uncle Charlie that died, you remember him? It's not over. He will get up out of the grave. It's not a zombie. He will be 
a new person. Other places Paul talks about more detail what that happens. But for now, let's move on. It says, then together with them. With who? Uncle Charlie and Aunt Susan that have died before. Together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up. This is where we get the word rapture, by the way. Caught up. And um, maybe I'll take a little time next time to go a little more into that um, so that word, we think of it as being caught away. In fact, once again, <laughs> 70s, 80s, when I was growing up, there was this great song that we would sing, and it went like this, some glad morning when this life is o'er. Everybody sing, I'll fly away. And we really got excited about that, and we shouted and had a Jericho march. If you don't know what a Jericho march is, that's when everybody in the church, I grew up Pentecostal, uh, everybody up gets up in the church and they walk around the entire place and we'd sing, I fly, we didn't do that every time, I'll fly away. And that meant that we were going to be caught up, now notice this, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now we're going to break this down in just a minute, but get this phrase, because this phrase is sort of the basis of everything people believe, that we'll be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we'll be with the Lord forever. Now, um, this idea, first of all, of being caught up in the clouds. And, uh, let, let me just stop and tell this, this, where this idea even comes from. Um, I'll, I'll go back over here. When, when Jesus, you know, left this earth in the first century, and for centuries and centuries after that, different ones of his followers would try to explain things that happened to him, including here Paul in the first century writing to the Thessalonian church. The idea that there was going to be a rapture of the church and that there would be people left behind is unheard of for 1,800 years after the resurrection of Jesus. You can't find it anywhere. Nobody thought that there was going to be a rapture of the church with people being left behind here. Now, just because an idea is new doesn't make it wrong. But this idea of a rapture happening was introduced around 1820. If you're going to introduce a new idea, though, you need to have a lot of substance and foundation to override something that people have been looking at for 1,800 years and they haven't seen it. But suddenly you see it, there better be a lot of scriptural basis for this new idea that you have. That's all I'm saying. Well, in 1820, over in England, there was a farm girl and this farm girl had had a fever for several, several days. And after having this fever for several days, she had this dream or vision where she saw that the return of Christ was going to be a two-stage process where Jesus would return to the earth but not actually touch down on the earth, that people on the earth would be would raise to meet him and that they would go away to heaven for a while while bad things happened on the earth. Then later Jesus would return to make everything right. Well, this, this idea, this supposed spiritual experience that this farm girl had caught the attention of a traveling evangelist named uh, John Nelson Darby, who was an itinerant, uh, sort of a tent preacher, actually, in England in the early 19th century. And he began to preach this message in his uh, meetings. And it probably would have died with him. He wasn't necessarily a prominent, prolific speaker, but uh, a man by the name of C.I. Schofield caught, this, um, caught wind of this doctrine, this teaching, and put it in the notes of his Bible, the Schofield Reference Bible. If you were raised Methodist, Baptist, maybe Presbyterian, Pentecostal, you're familiar with this Bible. All through the early 20th century, for sure, it was the go-to Bible with all these notes and things that went along with the scriptures to teach you certain doctrines from the Bible. So this, <clears throat> this idea all came from a farm girl who'd had a fever, who has a supposed vision that we are going to have a rapture. The idea before 1820 was unheard of. And it comes from this phrase that we will be caught up in the clouds to meet him in the air. Now, in, 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 the, in the Old Testament, there are several examples of, of a person, of God, 
coming on the clouds of heaven, arriving on the clouds. For example, I just want to read something here in Psalm. This is uh, David, King David, talking about God um, enacting vengeance upon his enemies. It says, he parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. He goes on and says, he mounted the cherubim, which are angels, and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. Now, is this something that David actually saw? That God was on the clouds? He goes on and says, he made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. The dark rain clouds of the sky. He goes on and says, out of the brightness of his presence, clouds advanced with hailstorms, hailstones and bolts of lightning. In the, in the Old Testament, when God showed up on the scene, they aren't saying, wow, we looked up and God, well, which was it? Was he riding on an angel? Was he like, yeah, or, you know, did he have a, a bridle on him and a saddle on this angel? No, it's a dramatic, creative depiction of God moving. He's not actually seeing God riding on a cloud. God's not like surfing on a cloud. There's dark clouds under him. David didn't look up and go, wow, there's God coming on a cloud. That's not what the return of Jesus is either, him being on actual clouds. And many times in, uh, in other places in scripture, and when uh, part of the reason we're nerding out on this subject is because I want you to understand how to understand the Bible in general. This particular subject will help us to see that taking certain things literal that were meant to be figurative or were meant to be uh, you know, Im imagery that is just creative and dramatic to make a point, if we take it literal, we will go down a wrong path. But riding on the clouds, many times the clouds, by the way, are, are used as a creative, pictorial way to say large groups of people. When you see clouds, think crowds. When Paul says, and let's go back there, then together, the next, the next slide there, we'll meet him in the clouds, it's very possible, even probable, that he's referring back to this group of people that Jesus is bringing with him to rise from the dead, that those clouds of people. In Hebrews chapter 12, uh, the writer says, behold, we are surrounded with clouds of witnesses. He means a big group of people. So to meet the Lord in the air. And um, I think we'll have time to talk about this. Here the, the word air does not mean at all oxygen and nitrogen and the things that we breathe in. Um, in fact, the Apostle Paul himself, in writing to another church, says this in the book, in the, his letter to the Ephesians, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Kingdom and air in this situation are basically the same word. Um, the King James Bible says that Satan here is the prince of the power of the air. Well, it doesn't mean that he's in charge of the oxygen. The air means his, his, uh, his air sphere of inf influence, his kingdom, the place where his authority rules and where his authority matters. He, the, the area that he's in charge of, this word air is what they're talking about. So then, if we go back, go back one slide, sorry, um, to meet the Lord in the air, it's not talking about we're actually going to come off the ground and fly, it means that Jesus is returning. And in fact, and we'll end with this and maybe pick it up again and explain further. The picture that Paul is explaining to his first century audience is one that they would easily recognize of when the Roman army would go out to battle or perhaps the Roman army had taken over a particular city and maybe the king was even there. The emperor himself was there. They would go out as that as the emperor or as the general, he'd went out to battle and he had won the victory and he's returning with the spoils of war. He's returning with the loved ones that left you to go out to battle with him and he's returning victorious. The people of that town would go out to meet him. And just, just like Jesus coming into Jerusalem where the people laid down their coats and they waved palm branches, they would go out to meet this returning king and they would 
join him and celebrate and sing songs. We see in the Old Testament this happened with David when he returned from killing Goliath that the women went out with tambourines and they danced and they sang and there was this huge party but they didn't go somewhere else. (laughs) David was returning home. They went out to meet him, to bring him home, to celebrate him as a hero and then they joined him in his new kingdom, in his new victory, in his new authority, they were caught up in that. They became part of his new kingdom of authority. This has nothing in the world to do with us leaving this earth and going away to be with Jesus while bad things happen here. This is Jesus returning someday to the earth that he created to be perfect and whole and entire and us joining with him to make this place everything that he ever dreamed of. This is what the end of the world, as we know it, looks like. That's all the time we have for today. We'll talk more about this next week. I'm sort of looking forward to it. I hope you like nerding out a little bit, and I hope by the end of this, you'll not only understand the Bible a little bit better, but you'll know Jesus a little more too. Thanks for hanging out with me, guys. Have a great week.